How's it going? Everyone enjoying DerbyCon? <laughs> how about the uh, off? <laughs> how about the concert last night? Was that was that was that good? I didn't I didn't make it. I was uh, too worried about this. So, um, whether it's your first time here or, or your eighth, like mine, um, I uh, hopefully everybody's having a great time. I really I really appreciate you coming to my talk. Um, I know there's there's lots of great content out there. Um, this conference is a little bit special for me because it's my first time speaking at DerbyCon, so I'm excited to, to be up here in front of you. Um, so with that, let's jump in the talk. Here's a little bit about me. Um, I'm a developer, InfoSec nut, um, and a CrossFit addict. So um, with my, my children actually here, and um, we go to CrossFit, and my, my youngest actually is a competitive gymnast. So fitness uh, helps me balance uh, the, the stress of InfoSec. Um, that's my GitHub account. There's some info on there. Um, a couple of projects that I've open sourced. Um, so why this talk? Why now? Um, a lot of people ask me, like, what's the best way to get into information security? I kind of came at it at a different uh, route than some. I started as a software developer, um, system administrator um, a long time ago. And I, I built web applications, and then over time, I kind of started looking at web applications differently and figuring out ways to get information to come out of them that they weren't designed to do. Um, it was a, it's an exciting way to, to understand the technology, but then also understand uh, the security impl implications for different code practices. Um, um, <clears throat> so uh, one of my friends, Rob, Rob Fuller uh, Mubix, uh, posted this tweet uh, recently, and it kind of captured what I see as uh, my motivation for doing this talk. Um, you know, I, I know that I have some information to share, and hopefully it'll be uh, well received, and, and hopefully everyone learns something out of this talk. There's been a, a good bit of talk. Um, April Wright did a talk this morning at 9 on imposter syndrome. And, you know, kind of in a nutshell, I'm sure most of you know, but imposter syndrome is where you feel like you know this little bit and everybody else has this wealth of knowledge, right? And in actuality, you know a good bit of what everybody else does, but there's information that you have and your perspective that's unique. And I think it's our job as a community to share what we've learned with each other and then uh, you know attend talks like this and, and continually gain information. Um, it's, not, it's not just me, it's like really hot in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> okay, uh, so th this talk is, is kind of an interesting situation that, that happened to me uh, one Easter. Um, we were sitting out on the dog run, which is the kind of the place between the, the house and where my dad's shop is. And, you know, anybody from the south kind of knows what a dog run is. But um, we sit out there because it's got a nice cool breeze, and we're, which would be great right now, right? Um, but we're sitting out there, um, you know, just talking. And one of my cousins asked my mom, like, hey, which Wi-Fi do I connect to? And she says, oh, it's this one. But don't connect to these other two. I don't really know what those are. And, you know, being in the information security community and the fact that they're remote, like, really remote, right? Like, they're so far out. There definitely shouldn't be, like, rogue Wi-Fi access points. So I, I checked, and and yeah, there are these two random access points that she had no idea. And I was like, when did these show up? And she's like, I don't know, the other day. And I thought, okay, that's that's freaky. And you know, my 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 spidey sense starts tingling, right? I start worrying, like, what could it be? Could it be somebody like putting out <laughs> rogue access points to capture data? You know, because if you're in the information security field, like everything's scary, right? Like you you. You see the evil in everything that somebody could use it for. So, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to stop by Warcaller's booth out there, but, uh, at DerbyCon 6, they actually have this little, uh, little tool called the Dope Scope. And what it is, is the highly directional antenna. And I, I advise you to go check it out. It's really cool. But, um, you basically put it up to your eye and where you look, you'll see the access point. And as you can see, on the left side, 
When the numbers get smaller, that means you're getting closer to the access point. I think the first time they used this was at um, ShmooCon, and they had like a fox and the hound capture the flag kind of thing where you had to find the guy holding the Wi-Fi access point. But anyway, so this tells told me, okay, there's this open Wi-Fi access point, and I was getting closer to it. So I enlisted the help of my nephews, and we started kind of walking around my parents' house trying to figure out <laughs> where these two Wi-Fi access points were coming from. Um, you know, at first I was thinking, oh, maybe it's their TV or their or their um, digital something, right? And and as I got closer to the their bedroom, the, the signals got stronger and stronger. And then um, I noticed on the sides of their bed they had these two remotes. And I was like, okay. So I handed one of the remotes to my nephew and I said, now go out of the room and I want to see if the uh, the signal drops. And it did. And I was like, okay, it's the remote. So I like went back to my mom and I'm like, it's these two remotes. They're the Wi-Fi access point. And, and like as soon as I said it, I'm like, why would these two remotes be an access point, right? Um, so, <clears throat> um, so I go back into the bedroom and I, I, I crawl underneath the bed and the signal's like super strong now. And, um, I notice these two little boxes there and I'm like, okay, okay, this has definitely got to be them, right? Um, so I go over and unplug one and, you know, based on the title of the talk, yeah, it was definitely the thing, right? So, so I'm like thinking, why did these beds have access points? I mean, what, what possibly could be, the, you know, use, uh, the use of them? Um, turns out they're these fancy adjustable beds and, and, um, you know, I, I, you could grab one of the remotes and I, you know, pushed up and, you know, the head comes up and then you push foot and the foot comes up, right? Pretty, pretty simple. Um, and so what I wanted to do was hop on the, hop on these, this access point to kind of just see what's here, right? Uh, this is just a little bit about my, uh, my tech. I, I carry a, a, a Kali Linux laptop and, um, one of the things that's really important is my Wi-Fi card has to be in, has to be able to do monitor mode. Um, and, and we'll get on to that a little bit later about what monitor mode is and, and, um, kind of what this command is. But this shows you the capability of the wireless monitor, uh, wireless, uh, card. Cause not all cards can do this. <coughs> so I, I logged onto the access point. I was given a IP address by, by the, um, by the DHCP server. And as you can see, I ran a command here called um, if config. And basically what that does is displays the information about my networking connections. Um, and, and this is the one that's important right here. So I was given a, an IP address of 192.168.178.89. Um, and you know, just like at home, when you log on, that, that'll be different sometimes or sometimes it'll be the same. Um, what's, what's an important piece right here is this, this net mask number. What that tells me is that's a slash 24. So that means that there's 254 possible hosts on there, counting myself, that it could be accessible. All right. So now I know kind of where I am in the world on this access point. What, when you're on a network for the very first time, what do you, what do you generally do? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, in map. Um, so Nmap has about 11 billion options. So um, this this talk is definitely not an Nmap talk. These are two resources that I've used. Um, you know, the, the top one's been out for a long time. The second one's a, a pretty recent version, and it has you has a bunch of scripts because Nmap has an amazing capability to do all kinds of craziness on a network. And um, but this talk is just about like, okay, I, I'm I'm on this network. And now I got to kind of figure out what's around me and, and what's going on on this network. Um, and, and like I said on the first one, um, I'm on a slash 24. So what I tell Nmap to do is for this subnet, I want you to scan every IP starting at one or however it does it, you know, randomly distributing them or something. Um, and then I want you to attempt to connect to every port on every machine. And by default, Nmap will scan the top 1,000 ports, and I just learned the other day uh, that there's a, a nice file that you can configure <laughs> to, to change that if you wanted to. Um, so I ran this scan, 
Uh, my machine doesn't show up because I don't have anything listening on my on any of my ports. Um, but if you'll notice, um, right here, there's something listening on port 80 on um, this IP address. And that's the only thing that was listening. So I wanted to do a bit more research on that. But uh, one interesting one interesting fact, um, this MAC address right here, Nmap's pretty handy, and they they kind of tell me who developed that techno who developed that technology. Um, but if you didn't know, you could actually go online to Wireshark, which is another tool I'll use a, a bit later, um, and enter a MAC address, and it'll tell you who manufactures it. If you ever see this one on your network, this one on the right here, you. Uh, you might want to rethink something uh, about your life. Because if you can see there, that's the NSA. So if the NSA is on your network, you might have done something wrong. Um, but this right here is called an OUI. And basically, it's a organizational unique identifier. It's a 24-bit unique number that identifies hardware. Um, so you can tell based on the MAC address. And you can change the MAC address. I think Kali, by default, gives you a brand new one every time. So, um, but you can get a little bit of information about the technology. So I know that that wireless card was developed by, by that company. Just to be completely sure there's nothing else listening, um, I kind of ratcheted Nmap up just a tick and told it I want you to scan all 65,535 ports on that IP address. And as you can see, nothing else was listening um, other than port 80. So kind of the next steps are, okay, I, I've identified that something's listening on port 80, and most of the time that's a web server, right? You can listen on any port. There's just conventions to tell you to listen on one port or another, um, but most of the time it's a web server. So I, I connected to the, the website, and I basically got a, a not found error. So there was no index page, because when you usually hit a, hit a website, the index page is what's rendered. And they didn't give me the opportunity to see something like that. So I kind of had to dig in a bit deeper and figure out what was actually on that site. Um, it was a web server, by the way, in case I didn't mention that. But um, OS Top 10 um, is the top 10 vulnerabilities that OWASP, the Open uh, Web Application Security Project, classifies as the most prevalent. And I think their 2018 is about to come out. I didn't, I didn't find it online, so... Um, this is this is last year's. I um, mean, I think they've changed it a bit this coming out year. Um, I think they broke it down into categories, and one of the new categories is IoT. So, interesting. Um, definitely a great resource. Uh, definitely a great community. If you if you're new and you want to get into application security, um, obviously OWASP is great. They have a they have a tool, and unfortunately, I think it's actually deprecated now. Um, but I've used it for many years, so it's kind of my go-to when I'm on a network and I like the like, for example, we're doing the, the Capture the Flag right now. One of the sites inside the uh, Capture the Flag doesn't have any, uh, have an index page. So I used a tool similar to this on that, on that uh, challenge. Um, but as you can see up in the top, you, can, you specify the URL. One point of clarification here, you want to do this on something you have access to, because this is very, very uh, noisy. And um, as you'll see in a minute, it can cause some problems. Um, but basically, I said, okay, I want you to open up 10 threads. That means start 10 processes and start connecting to this web server and make get requests out of this word list. And I downloaded a word list from um, Digination, and um, you know, it, it all kind of depends on on what type of site you're going after. Generally, if you're ever on an engagement, you want to pull uh, company-specific words into your something into your word list. So. If they're an administrative site, you want admin, you want something specific to there because not all word lists are going to be um, good for each specific target. Um, this is a kind of a generic one. And basically what I said was, for every word in this list, connect to this web server and see if that's there. And if you find something, start again and basically start being recursive down. So it would make a request for, let's say, admin. And if it found admin, and they would make a request again for admin slash admin and kind of do that all the way down. Um, and it'll have 10 processes connecting to each individual one. And right off the bat, it, I started to, to see these under sys. And so there's a, there's a file called slash sys, and it returns some information. 
And then, as, as you can see, it kind of starts iterating through on the sys and starts, um, you know, continuing to make those requests. But if you notice in that uh, upper tab, uh, yeah, I think I went a little bit hard on this one. Um, is this the first denial of service on a bed? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, but I, I've, I've got some decent information. Um, so I, I figured I'd go a little bit slower and not so heavy. So I switched to a tool called curl, which is, which is a command line um, utility that makes web requests. And it's, it's highly configured as well. Um, probably not as much as Nmap, but pretty close. Um, and you can do some amazing things with it. So my coworkers are here and I have, have done some pretty cool things with it. Um, so basically what I'm telling curl is I want you to be silent. Don't, don't show me a bunch of connection information, but I want you to be as verbose as you can with your responses. And I want you to write the output to standard out. And then I want you to connect to that URL slash sys. And just a, a quick primer on HTTP, um, because obviously that's out of scope for this as well. Um, I issued a GET request. Um, protocol's HTTP 1.1, which is not really relevant for this because we have an IP address. Um, and then um, my user agent is curl. So this is what the uh, the web page thinks my browser is. So if you, when you go to a browser or a website in Chrome or Firefox, there's a user agent string that's sent along to them. And it kind of tells the website some information about yourself, like what operating system you're using, what browser it is, and the website knows kind of how to respond to you. Um, and then this right here is the server's response. It basically says HTTP 200, which basically means, hey, everything's good on my end. You, you sent me a valid request. Here's your, uh, here's your content. Um, it, it identified itself as a Marvel uh, WM server. Um, I'd never heard that, seen that before, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then it's telling me that, hey, I'm about to send you some JSON content right here. And so this is, the, this is JSON content. Um, it's basically like any website you go to, like Facebook or, you know, anything with like a real rich interface, more than likely under the covers, it's JSON. Um, and then the, the, the JavaScript or whatever frameworks in front of it is, is kind of rendering that for you in a usable way. Because that's not really usable by, by a human. <coughs> So I, I kind of continued to, to poke around on some sites. And one of the things I, I did here was um, I, I reached out and leveraged Python and told it, hey, can you clean this up for me so it's a little bit more readable? And you can kind of see that over here on this other side. And what this sys, sys uh, request returned was a lot, like a, a lot of really in, interesting information. Um, it told me it's BSS, BSSID and... Um, you know, it told me a bunch of information about how to connect to it. And I assumed that was for um, whatever this service was built to do, right? Some kind of client was going to reach out to this thing, and it's kind of telling it, hey, this is my information. You want to connect to me. Um, and with the, the Marvel information, I went out to their GitHub site, and this is a great resource. If you ever have to do something similar to this, you can kind of um, figure out, okay, this is a Marvel WM server, whatever that means. And you kind of use Google GitHub and go to their site and look at their source code. And it was all written in C. And um, I haven't done C in a, a long time. So I didn't dig too much into the C code of this. Um, but one of the things I found was a nice little JavaScript page. And if you remember, I was mentioning that more than likely JavaScript is what's interacting with the application server or with the uh, actual API. And so these are the requests that it has inside of it. Any URL that I found, I kind of printed out to the screen. And um, so this gives me a better idea of, of what to go after. Um, and then one of the things I found in there was this uh, services call. Same thing. I made a GET request out to the services URL parsed it with Python, and then said, hey, show me anything that just has sys in it, because I just wanted to filter on only on that information. And um, one of the things that's really interesting here is so there's this bed that has an interface that you can request it to scan the available wireless networks around where you are. So it, it seems a little odd that you would have a bed 
that is actually sniffing wireless packets around you. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, digging into some other stuff, I, I wasn't finding very much. Um, so what I was going to do is kind of move on to a different attack, ser uh, attack vector, and uh, that was to capture the wireless packets that were kind of flying around the room. Um, Aircrack NG, if, if you don't know, it's, it's pretty much the default standard, um, and it has a massive amount of tools in it. I'm only going to use uh, one of the tools that it, it provides, but it's definitely something fun, you know, especially at home to run this just to see what's around and um, what what is actually talking to your access points. And we'll get into that in a second about how it's done. Um, there's some amazing capability, like you can actually crack WPA um, and I think WPA too. I, I haven't ever done that with with Aircrack. <laughs> Okay, so what, what Aircrack does is, and if you remember from the first or second slide, my, mo my wireless card can go into monitor mode. And what I want to do is basically, and you can think of it like promiscuous mode, like back in the day, you, you, you basically say, I want every packet. Send me everything and I'm going to listen to everything. And in order to do that, it has to have kind of direct access to the wireless card. It can't have anything else um, interfering with it. So what this these, this command does, airmon and g check kill, um, basically you can run check by itself and it'll tell you, hey, there's a couple processes it's like WPA supplement that are running that, that are going to affect my working. Um, I didn't care. Um, so basically check kill set, finds them and then, and then shuts them down. And then I ran the command again to validate that kind of everything was gone and, you know, everything was gone. And then the next, the next step was to, to put my wireless card into monitor mode. Um, and so I basically said, hey, I want Airmon and G, I want you to start and I want you to use WLAN zero. And it spun up um, this interface here. So it's a new interface on my machine that's kind of in promiscuous mode. And if I'm butchering some of the the uh, the specifics here, I'm sorry. Um, I I tend to leverage tools to do something that I need them to do. I'm definitely not an expert on these tools, but um, I'll, I'll use a tool about as much as I need to get something done, and then I'll move on to something else. <clears throat> so as you can see down here, this is, there was more, but my mom said I wasn't allowed to put her uh, other access points on the internet, so so I had to cut those out. So you, you, I've only shown you the top one. Um, without going into like crazy amounts of detail here, this is the uh, the MAC address of the wireless that wireless access point that I was connected to. It's open encryption. Um, it's running on channel four. Um, and there's, I believe the wireless spectrum has 14 channels. One is 14. You can only use that in Japan, supposedly. But so if you've ever been on a, on a, at a house, it's super congested. You might all be on the same channel because if you have multiple devices that are, um, you know, broadcasting and, um, connecting as access points, if you have everybody on the same channel, there's, it's going to be noisy and you might have packet loss. So you can actually change the channel that you're listening on to be a bit different. Um, okay, so the, the, the top one there is me saying, okay, I know this is running on channel four. So I only want to listen on channel four because Airmon, Aerodump will kind of hop channels um, to kind of capture everything, but I didn't want to miss any any packets that were being sent on channel four, and I only wanted to get information from that specific um, access point. <clears throat> and so you can see me here. Uh, I'm collecting packets on channel four, but but one thing's missing. See underneath that underneath that second BSSID, there should be some clients. So I'm like thinking, well. Why is anything transmitting to this? Um, so I flipped the remote over. And this is int interesting information. I actually found out about it from episode of uh, Hack 5. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, that uh, YouTube channel. Uh, great information. They, have, they had a, it's been a while, but they have a ton of information on wireless spectrum. And a lot of the information I've learned over the years is from th those channels. And um, one of the episodes they did was talking about FCC IDs. And, you know, the F FCC controls the wireless spectrum in the United States. And in order to 
transmit or receive anything, you have to get an FCC ID. And, and it's actually an amazing website. Um, you, you basically log, go into their website and you type in, you know, the, the, the code from the beginning. So that, that one in the box there. And you gotta kinda mess with it and, and get the code right. Cause sometimes it wants five, sometimes it wants three. And it, it, it kinda depends. But if you look over here on the far right side, it shows you the operating frequency of that that device, and I have it on my screen too. But uh, 400 megahertz and 802.11 operates at 2.4 gigahertz, so that this chip is not is not able to transmit data. So basically, what I've done is is discovered that I know nothing about this device other than it's an open access point, right? I, I've spent I don't know, at this point, probably three hours uh, trying to figure out. And basically, um, I know nothing. Like, I can't I can't see what this device is doing. I can't even um, basically understand how to connect to it. Um, so I went back to Google, and uh, thankfully, there's an app for that. Um, so I downloaded the app. Um, and let's try We're going to try this again, right? And, I, I, you know, with the app, you connect in. And you push the head, and then the head comes up. And I'm like, okay, cool, at least I'm sending data. And I know my device is not sending RF, so um, I, I fired up my um, uh, arrow dump uh, uh, command again and started capturing. And one thing that's a little different here is I'm actually dumping the data out to a file. Um, if you see right here, I'm, I'm calling it capture. And basically what I'm saying is instead of showing it to the screen, just go ahead and dump it into this file. Um, some people will take that data and live capture into Wireshark, and that's something you can definitely do, but I, I wouldn't advise it because Wireshark's just a piece of software and it has vulnerabilities just like anything else. So generally it's a better idea to, to not capture live data in Wireshark, but you know, each their own. Um, so I wrote it out to a file and um, opened it in Wireshark. And then Wireshark has this cool capability, you kind of go up to the top left and go file and then export, export all HTTP objects, which basically says, hey, if there's any HTTP protocol, you know, kind of that little, those gets that I was showing you earlier, if there's any of those, I want you to put it in a separate view. And I, I, I went to that view and, and this is what I saw. So I, I know I have data and the bed's moving, right? So I just don't understand enough about this you know, the way this is working to get it. So I go, go, go back to the packet capture and I see all these UDP packets. And so I, I kind of filter in because there's, there's a bunch of noise in these captures. So, uh, Wireshark has a, a, a language just like everything else and allows you to focus on a specific thing. I said, I only want to see packets from dot 87 and I only want to see UDP packets. And then there's a lot of information here in the, the, the stack here, but the most important piece is this little bit right here. So it's sending this packet and I'm like, okay, all right, I think, I think I understand what, what's going on here. Every time I push that button, it sends this packet and the, the wireless controller does something and it tells the bed, hey, do this thing. Um, Here's a bit more information kind of on the packets. They're all, they're all about the same size, um, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, and then so I'm like, okay, what, what can this bed do? So I actually got the manual out. I know it's crazy, right? Read the manual, but, um, um, so I mean, it's got like a ton of stuff that it can do, right? It can turn on massage. It's got memory settings, you know, high everything, right? So I dig a little bit more into this bed and, it starts to get a little scary because I'm like, well, what happens if this bed is in a room with oxygen? Like, I, I don't know if this is going to be, you know, anyway. Um, this, this one was the best. So I, I figured out how to send commands to this bed. Based on this information here, if I send information to this bed for more than two minutes over a 20 minute period, then it'll cease working. So what, what does that mean? So if, if I was to send packets to your bed for, and move it for two minutes, 
Then it'll lock up for the other 18 minutes. And I'm like thinking, well, this is probably not a good idea. And maybe I should get my own hardware because I don't want to brick my mom's bed. Um, so this is kind of a sidebar, but it's kind of, inf you know, related, I think. Once you're doing an, uh, once you're trying to figure out how something works, you want to get it in house, get as much information as possible. Um, I couldn't take it from my parents because they, uh, you know, they needed their beds to go up and down or whatever. So, um, I call the support line and, you know, these beds are kind of expensive. So their customer support is, is pretty amazing. Um, and I said, uh, yeah, I need to buy another, uh, controller for my bed. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. What happened? And I said, well, it, it broke. Well, I, we can send a customer support rep right out there and fix it. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I, I don't need you to kind of come out here. I just need you to send me another one. I don't know if we can do that. And then, so she's like, well, let me send you to sales. And then I get transferred over to sales. And they're like, so your bed broke? How did, it, or your controller broke? How did it break? And I said, uh, it fell in water. And they're like, oh, that's bad. And I said, <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I, I just want to buy the, buy the, the controller. They're like, well, all right, we'll send you over to accounting because you have to set up a vendor account before you can buy one of these because we only send them out to the, uh, to the, uh, manufacturers. And I called local manufacturers because apparently these beds are everywhere and, uh, they didn't have them either. So long story short, I ordered it. The box arrived and there's no power supply. So obviously this is, Fast forward a couple weeks, right? Because I, I, Amazon's great, but not one day shipping on a bed controller from uh, wherever. So no power supply, no remote. Okay. So I, I call them back again. I get the remote. I get the power supply. So now I'm in possession of this bed controller and my remote and power supply. So I should be able to use it. I plug it in and turn on Airmon to start finding the wireless signal. There's no wireless signal. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like every, every, every time you make a step forward, it's like, no, you went the wrong way. You need to go back and go this way. Anybody play the mud on the CFT or the, ca uh, the capture the flag? Go left, go right. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so this is on the side of the device. I'm going to like go. I was, what I'm trying to do is figure out what is this thing and where did the wireless signal come from? So I cracked the board open and this is my first time reverse engineering hardware and I wouldn't even call it reverse engineering. I'm just taking pictures of it and Googling it on the internet. Um, but there's a transceiver um, and there's only one thing that's transmits. So I go back to my handy uh, FCC website an FCC website is amazing. Not only does it show you this kind of de detail, it shows you pictures of the device, it shows you the internals, it shows you everything. So if you ever find something that you don't understand, I mean, that's pretty specific. I can know that I can tune a radio to 433.40456 and listen to the data, right? Or in that range, right? So anyway, another two or three weeks pass and I go back to my parents' house and I, I crawl under the bed and I find this that's plugged into the device. They didn't ship that with, to me either. So, so I, I kind of crack, crack that open and, uh, started digging around. Obviously this is it. So that web server that I was brutally pounding with request is this little bitty processor here. And I kind of felt, kind of felt a little bad afterwards, but. <clears throat> okay. So finally, I've got, I can see the wireless. I, I, I go ahead and I um, start another capture and I say, and I call it head up. And then I listen and push the head up button once and then stop the capture. And then, and I'm sure there's a better way to do this, right? But, um, and then I do the head down. And so this, this, this looks better. I, uh, I filtered out the rest of my device because I don't know what you people would do with that anyway, so. <laughs> um, and anybody want to guess what the OUI, OUI is, uh, what company owns that OUI? 
What's that? Oh, yeah, no, uh, no, the bottom one, the client. It's my, it's my iPhone, yeah, anyway. So, that's why I hit it, because I have it in my pocket and I didn't want to explode. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what we have right now is we have the ability to send a packet and know kind of, kind of what it is. Um, and so, what I did was basically do that head up, head down, you know, for every single button on the remote. And so now I have this pretty impressive list of, of capabilities. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to send this data to this thing and I'm going to control this bed from my laptop. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to send a UDP packet over to, uh, the 87th IP and the first one I want to send is, um, I don't remember which one I'm doing. Oh, leg up. So I want to move the, I want to move the leg up from my laptop. I, I close this code, type Python, you know, send, and nothing happens. Does anybody see my mistake here? Any Python coders? Rob, you see it? No? Okay. Um, and I do this all the time. It's encoding, right? Python 2 does not handle strings very well. Um, Python 3 is better. So basically, I, I add this one little line and say, I want you to be hex code. I don't want you to be ASCII text. <clears throat> and I, and I push, um, I push the button, you know, I run the program, and the bed, and the bed actually moves, right? The foot goes up one little click. So, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I, I was gonna do a video of this, but, it's kind of lame, right? So you're, I'm typing on my laptop and then the foot goes up just like that and it's like, well, um, great. Um, and it was recommended, well, maybe speed it up. I'm like, yeah, it's still just a foot raising up. It's not, it's not that cool. So hopefully my, uh, great description fills it in your mind for you and you're, and you're good. <clears throat> um, so going in there and changing foot up, foot down every time is kind of a pain. So I wrote a, a little utility. Um, Python has this great library called command that kind of gives you an interactive shell. And um, I can say something like head 10, and it'll send 10 UDP packets, and the head will come up 10, 10 clicks. And then I can say, you know, head negative 10, and it'll go down, right? Um, so here's it, here's it kind of... Uh, in action, you know, this is all the capabilities that it has. Of course, I didn't comment my code, so you see all the undocumented uh, features down there at the bottom. Because um, my code's so clean that it self-documents, right? <laughs> so why, why do we do this, right? You know, because we've got to hack all the things, right? You can't have something that's sitting in your mom's bedroom that you don't know what it does, right? Um, one, one key takeaway from this is just because your protocol is obscure does not mean it's does not mean it's sec secure. Because I mean, it's not like somebody would spend hours reverse engineering a bed for no particular reason. Um, but kind of on a, a serious note, um, some impl implications from this. Um, so I know the SSID. Um, I know the the chip manufacturer. So I could drive down a neighborhood. I never, I only did this on beds that I controlled. Um, but you could not only know that they have the bed, you can see what access points are nearby. Um, it, it's kind of a, a scary thing. But, you know, just like everything, there's some funny pieces too. The other day, my mom, uh, is new. I'm, you know, preparing for this talk. And she did, she did give me permission to post, post this, this, this text from her. Um, so I get a text saying, did you hack my bed and raise my foot while we were gone? And I, I thought it was funny that she thought I was that, uh, talented and that I could actually pull that off. Um, but, you know, the remote, which has been my nemesis the whole time, um, is, um, you know, more than likely the cat stepped on it. And, you know, just like everything in InfoSec, 
We always think of it as the worst possible case, but more than likely it's probably just a cat doing something like your keyboard or whatever. Um, so, so where to go from here? Obviously, there's some great tech out there. Mike Osmond put together this stuff. Um, Yardstick One and the HackRF, super configurable software-defined radios. Um, I didn't dig too much into this. I actually ran it. I could see the data. Um, but at this point, digging through UDP packets, I was pretty much uh, done with this. Um, I did spend a bit more time um, digging into that interface because, um, unfortunately, I didn't get shell on the bed. And that was the, that was the main goal for the whole thing, right? Because if you don't get shell, it doesn't count. But anyway, so I started messing around with trying to get command injection. Um, it's, it's a pretty rough interface. Um, I, I would need to dig into the C code, um, to, to get more information on that. Um, one bit of, uh, information. This was my first talk at DerbyCon. I really kind of appreciate everybody coming and, uh, staying for the whole thing. That's great. Um, Anything that was great about this talk uh, was due to these two uh, two folks that put together some great great uh, videos on how to present a talk. Anything that's bad about this talk was obviously on me. Um, so um, I'm I'm probably a little bit early, but I'm 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 kind of done. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. My house. Yeah, I did, I did, yeah, 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 so I did, I did unplug them, um, I actually stole both of them, I tore one apart, but then um, I was missing a couple slides, so I had to take it back, it's still plugged in right now, I need to go back and get it. There was, I think, a question over here? Um, so there's, there's two ways to control the bed, one's through the app, which uses the wireless, uh, with the access point, and the other one is that um, radio frequency on that 433 megahertz. So there's a there's a there's an RF remote. Yeah. So when I flipped it over, I was able to see that and then go look it up and figure out. Okay, this isn't the right thing. And so there's there's one chip inside the little box, and then that little dongle um, is. No, it's an open it's an open Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a question way in the back. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, um, well, like I said, it didn't want to brick my parents' bed, so that feature was not tested. <laughs> well, it's just the controller, and so so now I've got this hundred dollar controller for a bed that I don't own. So maybe the next next because uh, it it can control all kinds of crazy hardware. So it's just you know, solenoids or whatever in it. So I could maybe do something else with it. Um, but, you know, for right now, it's just sitting, it's actually sitting in my hotel room. So any other questions? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Or who? Go. There's two sides of the bed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you could use this technique that I, I did here kind of on any problem you run into, right? You know, I, I hit a bunch of roadblocks as I was, I was going through this, right? But, um, you know, you just try harder and, and, and keep going and, and then eventually you'll, you'll get to the point you want or you'll just run out of coffee and go to bed, you know? Any other questions? No, that's cool. Oh, the new ones are Bluetooth? Well, there's another attack vector. There's tools for that, too. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming.